Just give me two seconds to start it. Okay. Okay, well, we might get started. Um, I'd like to open today's uh, proceedings by a quick introduction. Um, my name is Deborah Young, and I'm the CEO of the RegTech Association. And I'd like to open with an acknowledgement of country um, and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and offer a very warm welcome to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, here today with us and a big warm global welcome to all of you uh, here today. Um, the RegTech Association um, is committed over the next two years to help members navigate uh, through the COVID-19 uh, crisis and its many challenges. And um, over the next couple of years, we're going to see um, re us really putting some effort behind elevating our advocacy and our education efforts, um, uh, looking for new opportunities to explore um, other markets and exports for RegTech, and looking at opportunities to seek investment and we couldn't do any of this if it wasn't uh, for our members. So I thank them very much for being on the line today. I thank them for their support. And I also thank you uh, for being here and a big warm welcome. According to the latest research from Boston Consulting Group, Australia is now number three in the world in terms of reg tech product development. Um, about two years ago, we were sharing that spot with Switzerland, but we have actually overtaken them. So we sit at number three behind the US and the UK. And I think this is uh, amazing and something that we can be enormously proud of. It helps us to put our best foot forward in programs like we are running today, um, as we now have very much a global audience now watching us. Um, this showcase series started out late last year in Sydney, where we ran an event. And, um, and then we moved it on to Singapore and we had plans for events in Auckland and in London. Uh, and then the pandemic um, uh, hit in March, uh, we were forced to postpone our annual conference. And so we've quickly pivoted all of our offerings online. And so far we've run um, three of these specific um, sessions, RegTech showcase sessions, and we've got a number of these in the pipeline. And in fact, it's our plan to run one every fortnight um, going forward. These will all be virtual and they will all be free to attend. Um, over the past three months, we've seen uh, 2,200 people from 32 countries um, come to our events. And today we're pleased to say we've got people from 12 countries online. And I wanted to let you know who was actually online so you had some idea about uh, who's in the room, uh, the virtual room, as it were. So we have uh, regulators on the line. We have banks both from Australia and from offshore. We have payment platform providers, um, global industry associations, investors, universities. We have large tech companies, superannuation funds, investment managers, insurance companies, clean energy representatives, trade and export agencies, consulting firms, law firms, and of course our fantastic uh, global reg tech community. Our topic today is around uh, people. And uh, today we're going to see some solutions that will help your organisations um, by providing insights using data to make better business decisions, to help your leadership teams and your boards look at things like performance, culture, compliance, and help you to meet your regulatory obligations. Our fantastic members today are from Pax Republic, Cognitive View, GRC Solutions, Wispley and DAISY. And these are all very diverse solutions uh, where we'll look at things like conduct, compliance monitoring and culture risk, compliance training, whistleblowing, 
and speech and sentiment analytics, to name just a few. Only our members get to present on these programs, so if you aren't a member, please consider it so that we can give you this platform as well, and I'll talk more about that uh, later. Now, there's a couple of housekeeping things that I would like um, to cover off. If everybody could be on mute, please, and please turn your cameras off. The only camera that we should see on is uh, when one of the presenters is speaking. We will do all of our um, questions today via the chat function only, um, which you'll find on your little uh, uh, toolbar there. Uh, please feel free to ask as many questions um, as you can. And what would be really great is if you could um, actually say your name in the question and which organisation you're from, because sometimes on these things that's not uh, so obvious. We're going to do our very best to get to everyone. Uh, we are also recording this event, so it will be made available um, afterwards when we send out the survey, which we'd gratefully ask you to complete. It won't take you very long, but that feedback is really important um, to us. And, and uh, it's really important for us today to stay on time. So each presenter will get five minutes and there'll be a two minute Q&A. And as I said, we'll do our very best to try and get to everyone, but staying on time is really important. But right at the end of today, um, I'm offering to stay on the line for an additional 15 minutes in the event that people do have some questions or would like to be connected with one of the speakers today, we can um, arrange that. So, um, it's now my very great pleasure to um, introduce um, our moderator for today. Um, San Retna from Accenture is going to lead us through, and he's going to start us off with a bit of an overview, and then he his job is to keep all of the RegTech presenters on time. San is the Managing Director of Risk Compliance and is the Risk Compliance Practice Lead for Accenture in Australia and New Zealand, and he is based in Sydney. He collaborates with clients to help enhance their customer experience, streamline their cost base and improve their agility through innovation. With almost three decades of deep and broad client and consultancy experience, San has driven strategic transformation initiatives with and for financial services organisations across the US, Europe and Asia Pacific. His work has focused on helping organisations to set up and manage their internal investments to strengthen productivity for optimal success. It's my great pleasure to um, ask San to come to the microphone. Thank you, San. Thank you very much, Deborah. Really appreciate the uh, introduction. Um, I'm really excited to um, MC this session today. And um, I will just uh, start off by uh, giving a little bit more background on myself. Um, I, in this space, I have been in the Silicon Valley and uh, for about a decade and I founded uh, three startups, uh, two of which flamed out and one did okay. Maybe that's why I still need a paycheck and not sitting back on my uh, on my heels. Um, but, you know, when we think about this space and we put people at the heart of every business, right? And, and that's a universal truth. The, the challenge is that as a result of those people risks, Primarily, when we think of it, we think of it from the safety of the organization and also for the people within it. It's always existed. With COVID-19, these have increased and it's quite easy to see why. For example, working remotely can lead to increased cyber threats on access. Uh, we've seen that through the Zoom uh, little patches that they had to do. To address these ubiquitous challenges, it's really daunting because there are complex dimensions at work, technology, people, you know, the environment that they're in. And when I looked at this problem and tried to really understand how we could solve for it, it's really chunking it up. You have to kind of tackle it by the intersectionality of a couple of dimensions. And, there, and then bring it all back together again. So when we think of this, and we think of the first one in terms of people and machine, right? And, and what's the focus here? It's about melding the human and machine intelligence. And how it gets treated is the foremost thing is to enhance skills to em embed a compliance owner mindset. 
Secondly, people should be encouraged to trust machines to help them move to higher value add activities, not displace them. In order to do that, the third point is critical. It's about creating the trust that is required in ethical AI. When we move on to the next area, and this is about security in AI, and the focus here is on safety and ethical, the cornerstone of trust. I have to provide clear guidance and training to organizations and people as to what, how to deal with the ethics around AI and data security and cyber. And, you know, I'm sure with the presenters, you'll get a flavor of that today. You have to introduce the concept of ethical AI machine and use examples that are tangible so that you move away from esoteric things. Thirdly, there's the blockchain and the regulator. There is an emergence of the digital regulator. And when you think about a digital regulator with blockchain connecting an ecosystem, data is moving across seamlessly and things have been checked more in real time. The third area is organizational culture and leadership. This is about re-empowering the voice of the employee and authentic leadership. The employee well-being is going to be even more critical because we've all been isolated. You know, I, I do not like the term uh, social distancing. I prefer physical distancing because that's what we're doing. But that creates a strain when we're not socially interacting. And I think the other way is that there's a significant risk of employee engagement dropping as people are geographically dispersed and managerial oversight is less quote unquote real. And then finally, the leaders have to role model how to lead when there are issues like cyber attacks, data threats, and be able to give confidence to their people. Finally, COVID-19 and the business. This is about supercharging the organization and the workforce resilience. Building workforce resilience is important to prepare them for re-entering the workplace to a new normal, and it'll be a staggered new normal in my view. And then and clear direction is required from leaders to support these people and to reintroduce them into their different environments in the new normal. Now, um, what I wanted to um, also add is that by chunking it out and looking at these intersectionalities, then you can bring it all together and really be able to have a composite and put safety at the cornerstone of what, what is being done. Failure is not an option. Everybody has to be committed to doing this and everybody's codependent on some, somebody else. So with that, um, I also wanted to add and thank the presenters that are gonna be coming on board. And I, I love that you've all given me permission to be quite rigid on the, uh, on the timing so that everybody gets an equal shot. Um, we'll do, as we said, five minutes. And then when it's about a minute in before the five minutes, you'll hear this noise. And so that'll be your cue that you get 60 seconds. Then we'll move into uh, the two minutes of Q&A. So with that, I think we can start with uh, Julian Fenwick of GRC Solutions. Julian will introduce himself and then give his presentation. Over to you, Julian. Thanks, Dan. Um, Alison, if we can go to the, the next slide, I think we can kick off straight away. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, GRC Solutions has been around for about six years. We, we intersect between reg tech and ed, ed tech. We develop training software with compliance at its very core. And we have a couple of different platforms. And the one I'll be speaking to today is our Salt Adaptive platform. We also produce bespoke training content uh, that's uh, you know, designed to enhance compliance within organizations and supply a library of uh, up-to-date and uh, customizable content for our clients' industries. Um, and, and we work both across the financial services and non financial services industries. You'll see there's a small link down there at the bottom, the bit.ly link. So if you want any more information or you want a copy of anything from today, it'll be there for you. Uh, next, please, Alison. 
So the problem that we're trying to tackle is that of compliance training. It's been around for a long time. Online compliance training has been around for over 20 years. And what's happening is that we're getting more and more of it. In some organizations we're talking to, they have you know, 10 hours per year. Others are up to 90 hours of online compliance training delivered annually and repeated annually. Often the content is really dry or text heavy, or even worse, it's delivered in a very condescending manner, you know, designed to be sort of childish and fun. But the reality is that in most organizations, particularly highly regulated organizations, they really just want to get through that training as quickly as possible and make sure that they've actually learned something new from it. It's often very time consuming and repetitive. And there's no recognition of prior learning. People might have to do an anti-money laundering course year after year after year, despite having worked in that industry you know, for, for, for decades. And, and the same applies across their whole organization with so much re repetition. At the same time, we're getting a, a huge acceleration of regulatory change. Thomson Reuters tracks this and has pinned it down to over 200 changes per day. That's about one every seven minutes in financial services. So there's a huge acceleration of regulatory change. At the same time, our regulators are expecting higher levels of customization and relevance in training. And the, the Department of Justice in the United States has just released some guidance on that. And it's the same sort of thing. They're saying, you know, this has got to be tailored down to the industry, the organization and the job role. So it becomes harder and harder to use off the shelf materials. For custom content, the traditional methods of delivering it have been very slow. It can often take months and months of planning and writing and design, and then off to e-learning development and, and to produce content. And by the time it comes back, it's all out of date and you know, before you even get it launched. The other factor that we've seen in a lot of learning management systems is that there's really low levels of detail in reporting. You're getting often just pass fail data only. And that's just not good enough, and it doesn't give us any predictive analysis. Next slide, please. So what we've been working on is an adaptive online compliance training platform that allows our learners to uh, only be trained in, in areas that they don't know. It skips over the bits that they do and enables them to use their time wisely. And in that way, we're getting speed to competence. What we want to do is engage those learners with material that challenges them that sits into their, you know, gets into their minds and, and improves that cognitive engagement with the material and, and make sure that they don't forget it. But we also are very conscious of the amount of time. And when you look at that at aggregated across a large population in, a, in any large organization, it's a huge opportunity cost to any, any major business. And so we need to reduce that and use that time efficiently. Next, please. So our platform has been built to be responsive. I think every platform these days has to be. We don't know what, what sort of technology the end user is going to be using, whether it's their desktop, their tablet, their smartphone, or maybe even a blended approach. We've embedded text-to-speech functionality to ensure that we meet you know, uh, accessibility guidelines, but also so that if you're sitting on a, on a bus or a train on the way to work or you know, when, when this COVID-19 thing lifts and we're sitting back at our airport lounges, you can sit there and listen to training. We've developed inline multilingual functionality, which allows the learner to choose which language they can do their training in. At the moment, we're working with a client across Asia who's doing training in 14 ju different jurisdictions in 16 languages. The last thing we want to try and do is work out who speaks what language and enroll them into different versions of a course. We want to make sure that they're all enrolled, they can choose which language they like, and that we've got a single set of reporting at the back end so that we have consistent uh, data that we can analyze. We also develop content development collaboration tools, which allows multiple people to develop training at the same time. They can work on the same course, they can use different light edit features and change things throughout the, throughout the course with it all being tracked so that we can roll back to previous versions if there's a, a requirement to do so. Following from that, we can develop things like campaign-based train, campaign training and micro-learning very easily. This is all about speed to deployment. If you've got an issue that's burning in your organization today, you need to be training on it tomorrow. You can't wait six months. So what we want to be able to do is produce content very quickly and professionally that gets out to individual users. 
and Julie, Thanks, you can uh, wrap up as well. Thank you. Okay. So the platform has been built with really deep data analytics. Uh, you can see there on the screen the sorts of different reporting that we're running. Next, please. Multiple uh, reporting systems built in specifically for compliance, particularly around our multilingual capability. Um, using that data so that we can find out specific areas and use a, that as a predictor of what's going on in organizations, understand the systemic issues that might be happening in different groups, and really address those in a remedial way. Next, please. So to sum up, our system's designed to, so that you can develop content with really strong tangible outlets. Uh, sorry, outputs. Next, please. It, it's designed to improve our learners' training experience and, in particular, recognize uh, prior learning. Next. Make sure that organizations have an ROI and a KPI that gets met from their training rather than just delivering it straight away and do that in a really secure and reliable form. Next, please. This is a case study from a bank that we're working on in the States where we've managed to reduce their training by 50%. And in doing so, return you know, thousands and thousands of hours back to that organization so they can use that more productively. Rather than doing repetitive you know, basic learning, they're able to advance their people into higher levels of learning and also get better cognitive engagement from that training. Next, please. A few of our clients, and next, please. So the system's designed with compliance training in mind, but we've also started to use it for CPD training, policies, products, and performance. It really doesn't matter what the sort of training is you're trying to build. Our platform is designed so that you can create, deploy, maintain, and report on that training in a really agile and productive sense. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Julian. I think we'll come back to the questions because we're already a, a little behind time. Um, so if we can go to the next presenter, please. Uh, Pax Republic, Marie Holmes, um, over to you. Uh, just getting into presenter mode, hang on. Okay, thank you, San. Hello, everyone out there. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Pax Republic is a foundation member of the Red Tech Association, and it's great to see so many people joining these sessions from so many places. And in keeping with our theme, I'd like to introduce you to Platos and how it can be used to elevate truth on risk culture, especially in the COVID-19 era. Next. I'm going to start with a reminder, courtesy of the New Yorker, of our shared humanity. Very human voices are often missing from how we make our most impactful decisions in business and in society. Plato's technology brings those hidden voices to decision-making tables. Next. Do you hear stories about healthy athletes dying from it or some older people manage to survive? Nobody can get a test. Maybe I should go to Canada to get tested up there. But, uh, I'm a trained doctor, like I'm a licensed physician back home in India, but, but I don't have a license to back myself. I think all we can keep doing is putting one foot in front of the other and keep moving. This is our shared humanity. Our founders at Pax Republic, Barbara Sharp and Tim Offer, come from a background in social research and reputational risk management. We know that the individual voice is the most powerful, but that too often it is lost for so many reasons. Our technology digitizes this deeply human task and unlocks a mass of highly valuable data to inform decision making at many levels and in so many domains. Next. Companies face a challenge to understand employees' lived experience when it comes to risk. Many are afraid to speak up, feedback gets filtered and the real truth is left behind. It used to be whispered in corridors, now it's left in chat sidebars, or not at all in a time of COVID-19 and remote work. 
Next. Plato solves disconnection. It enables leaders to dive deep to understand emerging cultural risks and finally hear those stories before it's too late. Next. Surveys can inform you that you have a problem, a bit like x-rays. It can tell you there's a spot in your lung. It can't tell you why. Next. Platos is more like an MRI. The human insight yielded informs why there is a problem and gives leaders reliable, truthful data to inform their risk strategy. Next, please. So what is it? Platos is a powerful AI and human moderated asynchronous conversation platform. It's built to elevate human voice and for rich interactive discussion. We call it a deliberation platform. It's the antidote to fast chat made for more complex mission critical conversations at scale to deliver rich data back stories to shed light on complex issues because your most powerful information source is people's true experience. Next. It is effectively a huge virtual meeting room with many applications, and in this context, it replaces analog focus groups, elevating truth and risk culture in a regulated environment. Next. We are complex social human beings, so we've made the technology socially flexible. It's text chat, but there's someone running the conversation, keeping it civil and flowing, so it's productive and troll free. Asynchronous, slow motion conversation is where we excel, and anonymity removes power imbalance therefore making it psychologically safe. Next. A quick look at a comparison. Our technology means much more scale at a relatively cheaper price. That's the beauty of using technology. It's savings on human resources, but also delivers far better quality insight faster. Next. How it works briefly, identify a topic to dive deep, promote the opportunity to talk, and then through the platform, invite participants in and talk in a slow motion way, not like I've been talking, over a few days. You can explore the data as it happens and after the forum is closed. Note that you can add other conversational data sources like Teams chat and Qualtrics open question responses. And you can also run it through your BI platform of choice. And you then have the people data you need to inform your advice and action plan and report to the leadership team about how to respond. And obviously rinse and repeat, cover the whole workforce, check in again at major milestones. Next. We are a horizontal solution and our clients include a leading university as well as professional services firms and their clients. And we are sector agnostic like RegTech. This case study, which I won't go through the details of, is a partner's fin services industry client. They were looking to do deep dives arising from a cultural risk survey. Normally it would have been done face to face, but there was no time and limited budget. It was related to the Royal Commission into Banking. I recommend you go through it later. So we're at the forefront of developments that leverage AI for the betterment of human understanding. And it is very exciting. And we're looking for people to be there with us. So if this resonates for your organization or where you'd like to be heading, please reach out. Thank, Thank you, you. Marie. That was very interesting. Uh, and for the audience, please um, send your questions in. I will curate them and then we'll have a Q&A at the uh, end of the session. Um, but now we'll move on to Charles Buolo. I hope I got that right. Apologies. Yeah, uh, it's Buolo in French, but uh, you, you said it quite right. So I'm um, Charles, I'm the sales lead with uh, Wispley. Uh, for the APAC region. Uh, thanks, Sam, for the intro, and Deb and Alison, thanks for having me in the conversation, and hi, everyone. Um, so, Wispy is a SaaS-based, um, not, not yet, <laughs> Wispy is a SaaS-based uh, technology platform um, that enables trusted conversation, essentially allowing uh, anonymous and safe reporting, um, you know, to, to your organization, and we are a proud uh, RegTech member. Next, please. So today I just wanted to ask the audience, you know, would you be a whistleblower? You know, no one wakes up on the morning morning thinking they're going to be a whistleblower. And it's uh, usually uh, speaking up. It can be a scary experience, um, sometimes relies on stressful processes internally, uh, also some complex uh, technology. And unfortunately, when the report or someone speaks up, um, there is a bit of lack of transparency of what happens with the information that you just 
uh, convey to the organization and whether they acted upon it or not. Next, please. So really what we're trying to do here is uh, shift the mindset from whistleblowing to trusted conversation uh, and providing a safe space through technology for people to take their first step in speaking up. Uh, our CEO and founder for the story was a whistleblower himself and he uncovered a $20 million fraud um, in a large construction company. And he realized that blowing the whistle is just not an easy step and involves some practical consideration that goes through the human brain and think like fearing of losing your job, what's going to be the implication uh, for, the, for, for yourself as an individual uh, and, and how it's going to impact you. So uh, what Sylvain and, and Wispy were trying to achieve is really provide a simple, fast and secure way to report any misconduct throughout the organization. And we see that with some of the organization we work with, you can see here on, on the slide, uh, an increase in reporting uh, and an increase in trust for people to speak up, which is uh, super important. Next, please. We like to encourage our clients to think beyond whistleblowing. Yes, Whistly will help you tick the compliance box. Yes, it will fit with your classic whistleblowing program. But, you know, as Sam uh, mentioned earlier, people are kind of your, your best asset uh, and you should really give them a voice in your organization so they can feedback uh, concern to you or just maybe provide some anonymous feedback on something that uh, bothers them in the organization. What would be the result of having a safe channel that people trust is boost the engagement and the morale of your employees, uh, increase the retention, and potentially avoid some bad reviews on sites like Glassdoor. Next, please. Um, so rather than talking for hours, and because we've just got five minutes and it's fairly short, uh, let me show you the product. Usually it talks for itself. Uh, this is what's going to be like for the employee. So um, throughout the mobile app available on the App Store and the Google Play Store, um, you download the app, then you will sc scan the QR code of your organization and you will create the safe inbox. And that's where you will start your experience, whether it's submitting a report or start just a, an anonymous chat, that's how you will start your experience. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just a few, a quick example of what you could set up having a, an anonymous chat with your employees where they can uh, start a confidential conversation. So they will scan the QR code, say, I want to chat about working from home. Um, it's a bit hard at the moment because I've got the kids around and I don't feel comfortable talking to my manager about that. I just want to uh, you know, raise that with someone. So uh, you can see the interface is very much like a kind of a Facebook messenger, WhatsApp-like type of chat. Um, so very easy to use. And usually the adoption is super quick because people are just familiar with that type of uh, chat technology. And also, all conversation, all reports that an individual will report through the organization will be kept in the same one location. So it's easy for them as an informant to follow up and continue that conversation with the organization. Next, please. So this is a short animation that shows what it's like when you start your experience. So when you download the app, you get a few prompts on a welcome and a bit of a tour of the app um, and the person will be then prompted to scan the QR code um, to start reporting or start an anonymous chat. So, you know, they start the QR code, they scan the QR code, they will create an anonymous inbox which doesn't collect any email or phone number, so it's totally anonymous. Um, it's super easy to use as you can see and they can start a chat. So. You know, for example, here I have a question, I submit my question and that might go maybe to your HR and people in culture and this might be related to COVID-19 and some of the safety measures you took at the office and the person can start chatting with you. Um, so in a nutshell, we're just trying to provide that safe space for people to speak up and provide the organization visibility on misconduct because you really want to have visibility on that and give um, you know, a voice to your employees because they're your eyes and your ears um, in, in your organization. Next, please. Uh, and it's available throughout the mobile app as well as the web base. So it's very, very easy to access and usually that increases the number of um, uh, reports and the engagement from your stakeholders. Next, please. Um, if that sounds like uh, what you're trying to achieve and, and get your people to speak up and report concern to you, um, then you know, ping me on LinkedIn or drop me a line, happy to assist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. A very uh, 
hot topic these days. If 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 uh, lots of folks had been able to have the challenge, I think a lot of the things that we're reading in the media, bad behaviors, might be have been minimized early. That's right. Um, now moving on to our next presenter, Dilip Mohapatra of Cognitive View. Over to you, Dilip, and forgive me if I mispronounced your last name. No, uh, that's fine. Thank you, San. Uh, so my name is Dilip Mohapatra, as, as San said. Uh, I'm the founder of Cognitive View. So we are like a rec tech and a sub tech. So we look into supervisory technology as well. Uh, that can be used by uh, companies within the banks or financial services internally as well as by the regulators as well. So just giving a bit of a background, so how we got started. So back in 2018, I was observing what's happening in the Australian banking and financial services space, oh, wow. mostly around that World Banking Commission. Yeah. So there has been so lots of... Lots wrong way, right? There has been lots of misconduct, so, uh, compliance uh, well, failures, you know, things that uh, lead to customer detriment. And I was thinking, you know, what can technology to do to address some of these challenges? So, and that's how we got started with Cognitive View. Uh, we launched our platform last year. Uh, but as we go deep dive into this problem uh, domain. Is so there's a background noise there. Sorry, uh, just the participants, could you all mute just so that Dilip can present? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. OK, so, so looking at this, giving a bit of a context. So what we have seen is uh, someone who is mentally challenged uh, has been sold a life insurance product over telephone cells. Uh, you know, people who are very vulnerable, like elderly or, uh, you know, Aboriginal people has lost their whole life savings because of bad uh, financial advice. And if we look at the claim rejection rate, it, it is historically high. So, and all these kind of things has led to, you know, loss of consumer trust in the whole marketplace. And, uh, you know, there's a sense of, sense of urgency. And uh, of course, there's a lot of regulations are changing post World Banking Commission and so forth. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So I want to sort of take a step back and define what is conduct. So uh, conduct is essentially, uh, you know, how customers, uh, companies do business, how they treat their customers, uh, you know, how they design their products, uh, their business models around it, uh, and how they support them. So it's essentially, uh, you know, the, it reflects our values. And, um, and, and we have seen this is a big challenge uh, in the whole industry. Uh, because of last, la lack of transparency, because of the culture issues and so forth. And when it comes to compliance, uh, it's kind of interrelated. And uh, if we look at um, uh, the, the, the number of compliance failures we have across the whole industry, whether you call it uh, the ASIC uh, Corporation Act or it's the Banking Code of Practice or Insurance Code of Conduct, or you have your own product disclosure statement you know, uh, around that, so there has been a huge amount of challenge on, on non-compliance. And uh, if we look at the compli complaint um, around the new new body we have called AFCA, uh, just in, uh, they have got huge amount of complaint. Uh, I think the number for COVID-19 itself is 3,000 uh, complaints they have received for COVID-19. So it's it's a huge, huge uh, issue around, uh, you know, complaint. And uh, customers has to look into not only prevent the complaint uh, landing up with AFCA, but the cost that comes up with it. Okay, um, so uh, next slide, please. So what so what we have done is we've taken some of these compliance issues, conduct uh, risk issues, and we have uh, used this AI technology. So if you look at the top part, what you can see is typically what happens. Uh, companies employ supervisors, they have risk and compliance officer, they have auditors, so they all look into, you know, a, 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 a lot of the customer conversation data to see if, if they're actually meeting their regulatory compliance requirements. And this is quite manual. It takes a lot of time and it's quite expensive. So we have automated that whole process uh, by doing uh, a speech analytic based solution. So we convert speech to text and our platform uh, embeds a lot of the regulatory obligations out of the box. Uh, so that essentially means uh, the uh, models have been trained with all, all those obligations in mind 
and it gives you lots of uh, actionable insights. So things like whether your customer is happy, angry, uh, looking at the customer experience aspects of it, uh, quality assurance about the agent uh, and its performances, giving you specific incident and breach, uh, depending on your uh, uh, compliance requirement, uh, uh, looking into conduct risk. Now, this is uh, something we have uh, used a very comprehensive solution, looking at what the regulators define uh, as conduct uh, and uh, complaint management as well. So okay, next slide, please. So these are the four areas that we have divided our whole uh, offerings. Um, compliance, uh, com uh, uh, you know, customer experience and conduct risk and complaint management. So uh, essentially uh, customers can choose one of these uh, modules and they can sort of start with it. Uh, but what we also offer is a more end-to-end -end solution. So, uh, and, and a lot of the speech analytics solution that you have seen uh, in the market, which gives you specific topics and key keywords, but then it doesn't give you the, the real uh, compliance issues that you are facing and then what you, how you would actually respond to a regulator if they come to you as an inquiry. So it gives you a more end-to-end -end, uh, uh, regulatory reporting solution as well. Next slide, please. So we worked uh, with a number of organizations, but uh, in, in terms of the outcome, uh, we helped the company in uh, AFSL compliance, Corporation Act compliance. Uh, we reduced that uh, the cost 80% because a lot of the things got automated uh, with uh, AI-based uh, solution. Uh, the manual review substantially reduced and the complaints got uh, up almost 50% drop uh, within first six months. Now, uh, so when I look at complaint, uh, it's, it's actually two things. One is uh, identifying those consumer uh, concerns in an early stage, but also reducing that ending up with uh, AFCA. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, since we started, uh, we have uh, made some good uh, headway, uh, been uh, voted as a RegTech 100 globally, and we've been selected as part of the ISIC RegTech trial. And uh, so here's my contact details. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to address that. Thank you, Dilip. It's definitely a, another hot area around conduct and, and looks like you have uh, developed something quite unique in the space. Uh, I look forward to the Q&A. Um, got some questions coming in. Uh, we'd like to turn over to Richard of Days. Over to you, Richard. All right, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, you know, I'd like to pick up uh, from Dilip and continue, I guess, the theme around compliance uh, and in particular around voice. So Daisy is a company I founded. I'm the founder and CEO. We've been operating in Australia for just over three years. Um, and as you can see from our tagline, uh, which is here between the lines, uh, that's really the essence of our focus. And uh, the core the problem that we solve for is the, the mass of unstructured data that exists in uh, compliance conversations, mostly through contact centers. So a number of the organizations that will be uh, listening in today will have contact centers or, or, or conducting their business by telephone. And that's the core challenge that, uh, that we solve for. So next slide. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the typical methodology that companies have used in the past is random sampling, and it just doesn't work. Like you, I'm sure all of you have been on a call where it says this call may be sampled for quality assurance purposes. The reality is that less than 1% of calls are actually checked, uh, and that's a real problem because it leaves companies exposed. So in, particularly in this era of, of COVID-19 where working from home, remote work, has become the norm, random sampling just isn't sufficient. And historically, speech analytics technology has promised, but not really delivered. The next slide, please. Um, what's important here is really around, the first step of this, the hygiene factor is recording the calls, and we've seen a dramatic in increase in the number of companies recording calls. Uh, but importantly, the cloud technology that's emerged that really has facilitated the increase in the accessibility of the solutions like DAISY provides. That's been a really important factor. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the, the, the focus today, it's you know those two factors around telephony in the cloud. The other thing that has happened is that the technology has really improved. Um, and early attempts at speech uh, analytics were really quite poor. We've now seen the, the accuracy step up a lot more. Uh, and I think what's happened is that new business models have emerged. So as we think about compliance, conduct risk, 
um, and looking at the general customer satisfaction, it's very clear that companies need to monitor and take care of, of the co customer conversations. Next slide, please. And so in terms of our differentiation, you know, what, what we do is, is focus on the accuracy of our solution. So if there's one takeaway around DAISY, it's around the accuracy of what we can do. Uh, and that is being derived through the way that we've created this system. And it, it uses a number of proprietary techniques and has some very sophisticated algorithms within it. Importantly, it's pre-trained. Uh, and this is an important factor. So unlike a number of solutions that are, are not pre-trained, our semantic engine is pre-trained. We use 55 sensors and a sensor is an input that enriches the speech to text. The speech to text is just purely the entry level. What we then do is we look at phrase matching and phrase matching is, is incredibly important because phrases give context. So words in themselves don't give you the in sufficient information to understand the intent of the client. So the concept of phrase matching is, is really important. From that, what we've done is developed a really sophisticated and powerful automated scorecard. And our automated scorecard allows all of the calls to be scored and ranked. And what we do is we find the anomalies. So with the needles in the haystack. And this is what's most important from a compliance perspective uh, is being able to self-diagnose your own issues and not wait for regulators to, to ask about the issues, but to stay on top of it. And that's really the, the most important benefit and importantly, it's also very flexible. So our, our system is, is easy to deploy. It, it's cloud-based uh, and it's consumption pricing that we, we use. So it's a full SaaS solution. Next slide, please. And this is a quick uh, you know, demonstration of the interface. Um, we've developed a really intuitive uh, media player that allows you to skip through the calls. And, and you know, one of the challenges is the length and complexity of calls. So what, what we've developed is a very straightforward mechanism for being able to review calls uh, and to be able to see the flags within the call where they've triggered the particular issue within the scorecard. So this is an example of the interface. It's a very powerful system uh, and there's an enormous amount of information value that, that's held within it. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of our customer base, we, we operate across a number of different verticals, but within the financial services area, We've been working with Zip um, in Australia for, for over 12 months. They've been extremely supportive um, and we've worked together on, on refining the solution for them. Uh, and they found that their growth, which has been spectacular through that period, has been really powered by this solution. We've also worked directly with regulators, um, including ASIC. Uh, and it's really exciting to be able to work alongside the regulators to, to see the power of speech analytics and what's possible. Next slide, please. In terms of our awards, um, you know, we've also been recognised uh, in through a number of different forums. Uh, and in terms of the recognition, I suppose the one I would call out there is the, the FinTech 100, which is KPMG's assessment of the top 100 FinTechs globally. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to be selected as one of the, the, uh, the, the, the emerging technology companies in Australia, one of only a handful. So that recognition, I suppose, is, is great validation uh, around the technology. Um, importantly, we've also uh, we've been successful working with Westpac on their Westpac Innovation Challenge, uh, and we also won the Insure Tech of the Year Award last year. So we, we're very much active in the reg tech community um, and, and would welcome uh, interaction with any of the, the companies uh, that are listening in today. Next slide, please. So in terms of, of contacting us for a trial, Harrison is on the line here. Um, his email address is listed there. What we'd love to do is to get involved with your company, give us a sample of calls, uh, and we'll run them through our engine and show you the power of what's uh, what's possible. So with that, um, thanks very much. And if there are any questions, happy to take them now or later. Thanks. Thank you very much, Richard. That is quite impressive, all of the awards you've gotten, um, having been in startups and know how, how challenging that can be. So well done. Thank you. Um, the, uh, maybe while we wait on the questions, I did have one that uh, I wanted to pose to you. Uh, where is the future of speech analytics from your perspective? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think we're at a very exciting juncture with speech analytics. Um, and what we're seeing now is the capacity of the of unsupervised learning. Um, and one of the, you know, when, and that's sort of a jargon frame for, for really talking about uh, the neural nets that can be uh, used to particularly understand call drivers and categorize and cluster the calls. 
into different segments. Um, and so we're very excited about the future for call drivers. Um, and this is an important aspect in terms of being able to look into the massive data that exists. The other exciting uh, opportunity we think is, is in uh, crossing into multilingual applications. Uh, and I think as we, we look to expand globally, you know, we're excited about you know, non-English languages uh, where there's been most of the work's been in English, but there's a huge opportunity to move into Spanish, French, uh, and a number of other languages. So the future for speech analytics, we feel, is is very, very rich. That's that's awesome. Um, what I'll try to do now is actually do a round robin going in reverse gear to our presenters, and I'll ask another question while we wait for questions to come in. Dilip, similar topic, but... Uh, you know, you're using speech analytics for uh, monitoring. What happens if your clients have already invested in, in, in that set of solutions? Yeah, thanks. And so, uh, you know, essentially, and, and we recognize that, that a lot of customers already have invested in, uh, you know, uh, speech recognition. So the way we look at it, if they're happy with the speech recognition technology, if they're happy with the transcripts and quality and output, we will work with it. We will embed uh, our uh, AI engine with that. And you know, we what the value that we uh, bring is on the the data that they already have it. So where we have a deep domain expertise in, you know, compliance and risk. So that's the value we bring to the speech transcription raw data. So uh, and, and from that perspective, they they don't have something. You know, we can just bring uh, the best best one there. But if they have something, we, we can sort of work with it. Very, very good. That um, seems reasonable. Um, let's move on to Charles. Charles, you know, when somebody wants to be a whistleblower, I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, how secure is the channel, whatever the channel is, if it's an in-face or and now you're asking me to do it online. How secure is that that conversation going to be? Can you talk a little bit about the security? Yeah, of course. I mean, and, and that's a great question. I think very topical when you look at the headlines that we're seeing, uh, you know, in the last few days around cyber security threat. Um, Whisper is actually certified ISO 27001. So it just explains that we go to a fair bit of extent of uh, making sure that the data is protected and, and safe. And it's it's one of our main focus uh, for, for the platform. Uh, and to give you an example, you know, when someone sends a report, we go to the extent of um, if this if they attach a file, which they can do, um, you can we actually remove the metadata that is attached to the file. So there's no way you can identify the person looking at the Properties. We also wipe the IP address of the device uh, from that was used to submit the report, uh, and and you know we run like penetration testing. So we do a lot of uh, you know security checks on the platform to make sure that it's protected because you know you don't want to have that information, especially when whistleblowing or just someone speaking up that it can be sensitive information. You want that data to be like protected in a robust platform. And unfortunately, there is some channels in place sometimes that are not. Um, super strong around security and, and that can be a bridge and I think nowadays organizations are becoming a bit more conscious of that um, so yeah uh, we, we, we're one of the most secure platforms out there when it comes to speaking up. That's really good to know. Um, moving on to Marie, um, help me understand a little bit about your solution and how it's different from things like Slack and Yammer. Sure, uh, and, and that's something that at first appraisal uh, people sometimes ask, but firstly Slack or Yammer are conversation platforms and they don't have the AI, the AI moderation that we do or the ability to dive deep on complex issues and they're not anonymous so you'd never use those to discuss risk issues like bullying and harassment and so on. I mean they do what they do well but they're basically built for a completely different purpose. You know, we're built for long form discussion where you've got people talking to the moderator and to each other. Um, discussion issues arise um, in the conversation. It's guided by a moderator. You know, over the space of a few days, you move from, you know, speaking about the challenge and then drawing out or the issue and then drawing out solutions. Um, so more people have a chance to contribute and there's no limit on what you say. Um, so, you know, that's really the big difference, the, the, the dive deep. Um, and the AI moderation. I mean, there are some platforms that may have some AI, but they don't do 
the deep dives that we do, they're typically very, very short um, pulses and so on. So, you know, Playdos is suitable for complex conversations um, and employees, of course, which is what we've been talking about today, but all stakeholders, it's built for different problems and complex problems, big issues. Very good. So, so having some some of the deep learning built in to uh, to differentiate. Very good, um, Julian. Um, when I was hearing you speak, the thing that was running through my mind, especially coming from Accenture, where we do a lot of integration in between systems, and it's generally one of the most complex things. You say Salt Adaptive can connect to uh, existing client learning management systems. Uh, how complex is that and, and, and how, how, how long would it take? Yeah, thanks. Sir. Yeah, we recognize that most of our, you know, particularly the larger clients will have a very complex and embedded learning management system. Um, most of those will use one of the, the, the SCORM compatibility standards and we, had, we adhere to that. So it takes us about 15 minutes to check compatibility and have content up and running. Um, and that way we're still getting the link back and, and providing the compliance manager with all that additional data and, and reporting. Very good. Thanks for that. That's that's pretty impressive. Um, let's um, we've got about three minutes and um, let's uh, kind of uh, go on. And I'm going to ask each of you in the interest of time, a very short, short question. In the startup world, uh, there are many, many challenges, um, and it also provides for great enjoyment and personal success. What is the thing, and I'll start with you, Richard, what is the thing that you're most proud of? Uh, for me, the, the thing I'm most proud of is being able to uh, do the innovation here in Australia. Um, I've spent a lot of time living in, in around the world in the US. Uh, I also was in, uh, in the US for many years. Uh, and so for me, it's it being able to bring it, that innovation to life um, and to be able to you know, show, provide jobs in Australia, but importantly, I think to innovate. Um, and I think for the other aspect to it is, um, you know, we've really focused uh, very actively on bringing uh, machine learning into a scalable environment. And I'm, I'm very happy to say that we've built, you know, very extensible platform using you know, all the latest engineering methodology so uh, including continuous uh, integration and development and i think for me that's that's something i've always been really proud of since my time at google um you know we, they, I, I feel like google really took software engineering to a new level and i feel that now that we have access to those tools you know it's, it's very exciting to be able to leverage them into the australian marketplace very good a noble purpose uh Dilip, same question to you okay thanks then um, I think so. I, I'm most proud of that the technology that we have built uh, can drive some real difference to the people who are vulnerable, the people who really need some help. And uh, as the companies can uplift their standard of their conduct uh, and the culture, um, I will be proud that this technology is bringing some real difference to Australians, but also globally as well. Thank you. Very good. Charles. How about you? Yeah, look, uh, for, for myself, it's, it's fairly simple. It's just uh, being proud to work for an organization that helps people to speak up in a, in a safe and easy way uh, because they're sometimes in a com complicated situation and it's not easy to speak up. And we're just happy to uh, contribute uh, in helping them uh, taking the first step to speak up. All the last three are very noble purposes and, and I do applaud you. Marie, how about you? Look, for me, my interest has always been in the interface of, you know, technology with humans. So I'm very proud to be working for an Australian company that's all about enabling inclusive leadership because the world needs it right now. Well said. In a world where people are exploiting polarization, we need to come together. Absolutely. Um, Julian, for you to round it off. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, I'd have to agree with all, all of the things said before. At GRC, we're all about empowering our client staff to do the right thing by their customers. And for that, we've been able to you know, pull a great team behind us and develop a fantastic product. Uh, I want to thank all of the presenters. Uh, I think this has been very enlightening and really also appreciate you sharing your personal 
ambitions. Um, over to you, Deborah, for any closing remarks. Uh, yes, thank you, San. Uh, I was very inspired by um, all of that, actually, because um, uh, I had done a little summary of what I was hearing and uh, the words that we were hearing were around safety and trust and better results for consumers. And, you know, reg these are the hallmarks of um, RegTech. Um, and RegTech can do this whilst, you know, bringing that efficiency and productivity um, uh, and providing superior data and transparency. Um, and, and, you know, what's really fantastic about, you know, the, the companies that we've heard from today as well um, are largely sector agnostic. So these um, solutions can be applied to any regulated industry vertical, not just in financial services, but across anything uh, that you could think of, such as telco, such as agriculture, such as health services, education, so on and so forth. So um, the hallmarks of um, great reg tech that we've heard from today. So I wanted to thank um, all of the presenters, uh, but in particular, I wanted to thank Accenture for their support of this um, program uh, today and to thank San and Georgina and the team from Accenture. Um, and also a thank you to Alison who sits behind the scenes here and, and changes all the slides for everybody. Um, thank you very much, Al. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention um, these um, events are happening every fortnight now. Our next one has just been announced. It's a financial crime event. Then we're moving on to cyber security. We're going to do some more speech and voice analytics in a couple of weeks' time and another financial crime and so, uh, so on and so forth. We're moving through the whole reg tech spectrum. Um, the 18th of March 2021 has been named as the uh, replacement date for our, reg tech, uh, our Accelerate RegTech event that was postponed from this year, so please mark your diaries. Um, this is our latest um, RegTech Association map. If you are not on that map and would like to be, please um, get in touch or stay online because we will stay online for another 15 minutes. There is the link if you'd like to become a member or you would like to explore that. Um, pop onto the website. There it is. And um, thank you uh, so much, everybody, uh, for coming. Um, you guys make this all worthwhile and make my job um, super easy and very exciting. So I'll call the official proceedings to a close. And if you would like to stay on the line, we're going to stay on for, um, for 15 minutes or so to have a chat. Uh, thank, thank you very much.